Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tips, Tools, and Techniques at the Sewing Studio. My name is Mary Janine, and I'm glad to see you here. I hope that uh, hope you get some good inspiration from all the different things I'm going to talk about today. I have a couple of announcements. Um, the first one is our shop hop in July, July 15th through July 30th. And if you're not familiar with the shop hop, it's just what it is. You're, you're hopping from shop to shop. If you go to all 10 shops and Gabrielle, let's do a, uh, a ceiling shot here overhead. Um, so there are 10 different shops. We've got a quilting palette, uh, beyond the stitches, ocean of threads, sew together, so many things, quilters anonymous, quilting play, the quilt place, sewing studio fabric stupor store here in Maitland, Nana's quilt shop, and then finally the sewing studio at Lady Lake. So that's 10 shops. And if you go to all 10 shops with this passport, uh, you will receive a fabric and a kit, uh, sorry, yeah, fabric and a pattern to make that, <laughs> that, that block. This is our store block and you'll get 10 blocks and you'll be able to make a patriotic quilt with all the different blocks. So that's our particular block. I believe that's an Ohio star. Um, so we are working on that quilt and eventually it'll hang in the store so you can see what it looks like. But of course you can make your own version. Um, and so the, the passports, you need to have a passport so they can get stamped. And the passports are $7 right now and $8 if you buy them during the shop hop. Um, there are prizes. So people's uh, every store will pull a name to win a $75 prize at that store. And it's probably, um, you know, a gift certificate. And then they'll also pull a second name and those people win a $50 gift certificate to that store. So pretty cool. Um, again, it's July 15th through 30th. And that gives you plenty of time to drive around and hit all the shops. Lots of people um, do that with their uh, friends. They get in a car and, and um, because it's 15 days, it goes over two weekends. So you could spend half one weekend going to half and the other weekend going to the other half. So anyway, shop hop, um, July fling shop hop. So it's patri patriotic themed. I'm going to put that over here for now. And then my other announcement, we had as, as per my announcement last month, we decided to start doing face-to-face -face tips, tools, and techniques here at the store. Um, so we're going to do it the Monday prior to the fourth Saturday, if that makes sense. So we we had we brought everybody in um, Monday and had a really nice turnout and everybody was so thankful to be back. And we had some really nice show and tell. And we're going to put up a picture of Georgiana's show and tell that everybody ooh and odd over. She had visited and I'm afraid I can't remember the name of the place she visited that had a rose window and she was enamored with this rose window. So she took a pic, of course she took a picture of it. She came home and she remade it in scraps. And if you know Georgiana, who's there on your right in this picture, um, she comes in with the most amazing show and tell. She's a very talented free arm, free motion quilter. And uh, I believe she has a handy quilter. And anyway, her piecing is always amazing. So we were just in love with this quilt. So I thought I'd bring a picture of it for you to enjoy enjoy that. So uh, yeah, so anyway, I'd love to invite you. I forgot to look up the date of the next tips, tools and techniques, but uh, uh, in the in the store, but it's again, it's the Monday before the fourth Saturday. So we'll be doing that again in June. Just to let you know, I'm going to be gone for my summer travels all of July and half of August. We're going to take the camper up to Vermont, try to find some cool weather, and then I'll be back for the August TTNT. So I miss July. So, um, so something in my name. Um, I feel like I had something else I wanted to mention, but it'll come to me. Um, oh yes, thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to mention. We having a we're having a Memorial Day sale this weekend, as we always do. And if you wanted to buy online, we've put up the discount code. It's Memorial Day 30. Use all uppercase, and it's 30% off your regularly, pri regularly priced purchase. So if you want to buy it online, you can get use the code. Or if you come into the store, you will use the code. If you purchase things that are already on sale, we'll take whatever number is higher, the 30% or the 50% or whatever it's on sale for. But that So that is 30% off regularly priced purchases. So, um, And then two more things. Well, one more thing. 
No, two more things. We've got a handout for this. And if you haven't printed that out yet, um, we'll put up the link for that. It was in the email that you got, but I would encourage you to print out the handout um, now. So when I finally start talking about these quilts, you'll be ready for it. You might wanna make notes on it. And we've got people from Lakeland and Williamsburg and Mount Dora and Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach and South, deep South Texas. Got, you got to tell me how deep south that is. It is not as south as Big Bend, is it? Um, yeah. So thank you for thank you for joining us. And um, maybe one of these days you can visit us in the store, and that would be pretty awesome. So that was the sale. So I talked about your discount code, and I talked about your uh, the handout. So go ahead and print out that handout now. If you have a printer, if not, maybe you can pull it up on a second screen or something. Okay. Um, I have just I'm just going to tell you about a couple classes in June because actually most of my classes are full or almost full. But um, um, look at my list here. Um, I have a binding class, which usually it's pretty full and there's only three people in it. So it will go, but it'd be nice to have a few more because it's always nice to learn from what other people are doing. So binding class is June 16th and there's still five openings. So I encourage you to come to that. Three hours all about not only binding, um, but also I talk about labels. I talk about putting a sleeve on the top of your quilt if you wanted to hang it. Um, I talk about lots of different examples of all the above. Um, and I will teach you some very quick and dirty ways to put binding on. But also, if you wanted to take it slower and do it by hand, we can talk about that. So it's a pretty full class. If you bring something medium sized to bind, you could probably finish it. If you bring a queen size quilt, you may not finish it, but you'll, at least you'll have all the tools. Plus, I have a little video that I give you a link for that tells you all those steps. And the only people that are allowed to see that video are those that have taken my binding class or my quilting basics class. It just kind of reiterates some of the things, some of the demonstrations that I do. The other thing that just has a few people is my finish it up class. If you've ever taken a class with me or you're learning, you learned how to do something in tips, tools, and techniques, and you're stuck or you don't know what the next step is, you can take my finish it up with MJ class. And that is June 30th. And I will help you with that. Just try not, please don't bring things that I didn't teach because it would take too long to, um, to try to come up to speed on somebody else's class or pattern or whatever. All right. If there are any questions, you know, you know, guys, that I love questions. So please ask um, and we will answer them on right now. So, yeah. So uh, keep commenting, please. I love to see what people are saying. All right. With no further ado, we're going to talk about the quilt behind me. Um, this, These are Dr. Seuss panels. Um, I was making something else and was looking for um, some pretty big size panels, flowers, I think I was looking for. And Kelsey and I found this on the wall and, or in the stash of bolts. And I, we really both love these 12 inch squares. And I decided to look for a pattern and make something with these gorgeous 12 inch squares. So they all have very positive, um, positive messages on them. So it'd be nice for a classroom or a kid's wall or just to cuddle up with. It's a pretty decent size quilt to cuddle up with. And if you were to ask me what size this quilt is, I would have to look at the, I would have to look at my thing. So it's, it says, I use six blocks. It says 36 by 54, but their quilt does not have a border. Uh, so yeah, border on it. So you're going to add another six inches. So it's more like um, 42 by um, 60 or something like that. Um, I know that it wasn't didn't get any bigger than 42 because I use one width of fabric for the back. So that's a Dr. Seuss um, paint, a fabric actually that looks like a periodic table, but it's got Dr. Seuss fun things on it. Um, so anyway, it's about 42. I guess if I had a um, I had a, a measuring tape, I could figure it out. But anyway, you get the size. Um, anyway, so there's six different blocks and in the little promo for this, I talked about de-wonkifying panels. I'm sure that most of you have op purchased a panel, no matter where you purchase it from, and you go to clean it up, get off, the, get clean off the edges, and you realize that it's not square. How am I going to deal with this fabric when it's not square? And this could be fabric from a very high-end um, maker and uh, you know fabric maker, and you're like, it should, this shouldn't happen. I will tell you that the actual panel was printed straight, but then when they roll it on the bolt, sometimes it gets wonky. 
So I'm going to show you how I de-wonkify panels before I use them. And this is a good one to show you because it's small, um, but the same, same technique for something larger. Oh, and by the way, we have some kits available. I think we've got six kits left. Um, so we put a picture of my quilt on the front, and then we have the, whoop, the um, pattern, which is BQ6 from Maple Island Designs. And I really like their BQ series because they work with large prints. So if you had um, t-shirts or large panels like I do, or square panels or um, large prints, this would be a great pattern. So it's called BQ6. So um, we've got those in the kit. So the kit comes with everything you need for the front of the quilt plus the binding. But what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna pull out the panel of fabric that um, I did this on Monday, so I already cut one out. We're gonna open this up. I'll show you what I just did. So the panel has, of course, six squares and I cut one out on Monday and I de it uh, for the face-to-face -face group. So I'm gonna cut another one and I'm gonna de that. And if you want to purchase this particular kit because it's already been de well, two out of the six have been de, -de just put it in the comments of your order and we will get this particular kit for you. Otherwise, we'll just send you a kit with virgin fabric that hasn't been, ooh, I didn't push very hard on that or I need to get a new blade. I'm not sure which. Do what I do what I say, not what I do. Don't cut across like that. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna close this back up, put it aside for the rest of the kit. And oops, I gotta clean this up too. And then I'm gonna pull out my iron and I'm gonna um, de wonkify it. It's all done with an iron. Goodness. I think it's also this mat, by the way. If you're having trouble and you know you just put a new blade in, which I know I did, this mat has seen better days and it's got a lot of um, crevices in it. So my solution to that, if I had this at home, is I'd flip it over and I'd use a clean side. And I know it doesn't have lines, but most of the time when I'm cutting, I'm using the lines on my ruler. I know some people like to use the lines on their mat. If that's the case, you're going to need to replace your mat. Also, you want to try to keep your mat clean. You want to get those fibers out. Sometimes when we're cutting um, polyester batting or even cotton batting or polyester fabric, sometimes those fibers get down in there and you've got to pull them out. If you don't pull them out, your board will not last as long as you would like it. You, if you want good mat maintenance, you've got to get those fibers out. So some kind of rubber gum eraser or some way to pull them out. We used to have a, uh, we used to have a product to make to um, clean up mats, but they no longer carry it. So I'm going to put that aside and we're going to pull out. Can you, we get a straight on here, Gabriella? Thank you. Um, I'll put this aside. So I have three options for you. What we're going to do is we're going to use our iron and a lot of mist water to pull the pull the, um, to de -wonkify. Okay, so this is one option. Um, we're calling this a roomy board. This is something, my, my husband has a little cottage industry where he makes these. Um, and you can find out more information about this on uh, my website, floridaquiltnetwork.com. But what, you, what it has is these um, two ribs. You tell him how wide your ironing board is and he puts the ribs there so it kind of snugs around your ironing board. And then what I really like is this gridded fabric so then I can take my, um, I could take my block, no matter what my block is. If I was, if I was ironing something straight, I run my, um, I run my fabric along one of these lines and I can make sure things are going straight. So, um, so this is very handy. Let's say you don't have the budget or the, or the space for something like this. And by the way, I no longer put this on an, on an ironing board at home. I have a, um, I bought it for my new house. I bought an Ikea book bookcase, put it on its side, and then that sits on top of it. So then I have storage underneath my ironing board. Um, plant choice B is my, I got a little travel ironing board for my camper. And this is basically just wood with batting. And then I found some gingham um, that's pretty heavy duty fabric. And again, it's got the lines 
So I think my point here is that if you're get, going to get a new ironing board cover, you just want to cover your old one, um, consider looking for something that either has stripes or gingham because that really helps you line your blocks up straight. Um, and this is this all I use for ironing. Option number three is um, kind of a fabric template. So I took some I took some muslin and I went around it not very well, it looks like. I went around it with a Sharpie, good enough to, I was trying not to get Sharpie on my ruler. So I was going around and I created, this is actually a 12 and a half inch square because that's the size ruler I had at home. So Gabriella, we're gonna do overhead shot now. And when I, when I have something like this and I steamed it really well before I drew the lines cause I wanna make sure it shrunk as much as possible. So I'm gonna take some pins and I'm gonna pin it um, like that, kind of outward in. That's, I wanna, this is a good time to use those big thick pins that come with your uh, magnetic pin cushion, or maybe you've got some of those yellow headed quilting pins that, um, that I, <laughs> most of the time I don't use, I don't like them very much. Okay, so I've got my template. That's what I want it to look like. And I think that was the one I've already fixed. So this is, yeah, this is the one I need to de-wonkify. I don't know if you can see this. Um, here's my line. If I run this right up this line here, now you can start to see here, it's not, it's not following the line. I've got to bring this fabric up this way. And again, this is not straight with this line. I need to bring it over a little bit. And then once I do that, I'm going to bring this piece over. So basically, I'm, I'm, I'm skewing the fabric back to straight. I know that this is the muslin is straight. I've got to, I've got to make this straight too. If I don't do that and I make the quilt, your quilt is not going to lie flat and it's not going to be a happy quilt, as most of you have know probably from, um, from making quilts with panels. Okay, so here's the first secret, my Mr. Bottle. I, I talk about this constantly because it is a game changer. If you don't yet have a Mr. Bottle, 30% off is a good time to get it. So we're just gonna hit this. One of the reasons I love this Mr. Bottle is you don't have to pump, 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 pump. You just press it once, look how, look how long it goes. So probably just, I'm really trying to saturate this, get it nice and wet. Yes, you could also take it to a faucet and, and get it wet, but it's it's pretty darn wet here. So now I'm going to take my super hot iron. I love these little Alyssa irons. They get super hot, and that's what we want. Now I'm lining this up with this line here, but I also have to line it up there. So you just got to keep playing. I use my fingernails, what, what little fingernails I have, to just kind of keep pushing down. So that is fixed. This still needs a little help, so I need, gotta keep, when it's hot and when it's wet, that's when that fabric is gonna do whatever you tell it to do, and that's what I'm doing here. So now I gotta pull this, this, leave this here and bring this over here. So I'm de fine with a lot, of, a lot of mist and a lot of, um, I think I just did it too much because you see this little curve here. So we're gonna, we're gonna get this wet and we're gonna put it back where it was. This is pretty, uh, you have to be pretty gentle because this fabric is gonna do whatever you tell it to when it's hot, when it's steamy, hot, and wet. Um, and then, okay, so that looks good. That looks good. I still need to come down a little bit on this side. So I'm gonna hold it up here and kind of pull it. I wish I had three hands, but you can do it. You can do it. You get the idea. And this one needs to get pulled in a little bit. So we'll just keep, we'll just keep playing. Um, the bigger the panel, the more space you're going to need to have. You can also do half a panel at a time. So with my, with a larger ironing board, I could work on the top half and then I could work on the bottom half. Um, this is still needs to come down a little bit. So I'm going to hit it with some more mist water. By the way, it's just water. And by the way, it refills very easily. So um, why don't I use a regular spray bottle? I find that the mist is so, the droplets are so tiny that it relaxes the fabric almost all by itself. I know long armors who load their quilt on the long arm machine 
and then find a wrinkle and they hit it with some mist and walk away. And 10 minutes later, it's dry and the wrinkle has, has relaxed and disappeared. So it will work all by itself. I mean, not for this, but oftentimes you can get it to work. I think, I think we're in pretty good shape here. So if you needed to play with it a little more, you could, but you get the idea. I'm using water and heat to de-wonkify a panel and that's how you do it. Okay. So I'm going to leave that because it's still a little wet. And if you've ever taken a class with me, you know, we don't lift things up and take them away until they're completely cooled off because that's how you wonkify something is by whipping it off the ironing board when it's still steamy hot. So we're going to just take this over here and move it out of the way. All right. So if there's any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, good morning from Michigan and Claremont and out of synchronization. I don't know. Nope. Maybe, maybe it's your, maybe it's your device. Maybe you could log out and log back in and see what happens. Kay. Every other word skips. Yeah. The sound is good. So give it a try and um, try turning off your device and turning it back on. I used to be a software engineer. And at one point I was a, um, I was helping people with their computers and they eventually trained them all that don't even bother calling me until you've turned your system off and on. And if it's still, you're still having trouble, then call me and I will help you figure out what's wrong with your computer. Um, but yeah. Turning things off and on. And you know, I I put my computer to sleep every night. And about every four or five days, things start to act weird and I just have to turn everything off, turn it all back on. But I leave so many things open and that I hate to turn everything off every night because so much work to open everything back up again. Anyway, the name of the the name of the pattern is um, BQ6. We have kits, six more, six kits available unless you've already bought some. Oh, really important. We're gonna head over here. I'm going to talk about one more thing in regard to these blocks. This pattern wants you to have 12 and a half inch blocks, uh, panels, squares, whatever. These worked out because of the way I had to cut it, I had to cut them at 12 inches. Um, and you might have seen those lines on my that board uh, fabric were 12 and a half inch square, and it was a little smaller than that. So when you go to make this quilt, if you buy the kit, you're gonna to need to cut a little bit off of this. Let's, by the way, this is, this is the block here, right? So this is the bottom of the block, it goes all the way to here, okay? That's my block. So what I did is I actually used their numbers and I created all the pieces, but before I sewed this piece, sorry, this piece to this piece, I cut a half an inch off of this, and I cut a half an inch off of this. And that then it was uh, the perfect size to make, to attach it to this. So um, just a pretty simple adjustment. And in fact, you can do that with any any time you're making, um, making this quilt. If your pieces, whatever they are, if they're not exactly the right size, you can just adjust these two little framey pieces to make it work. So hopefully that makes sense. Ask me questions, please, so I know you're listening. Calgary, Alberta. I was in Calgary three years ago, BC, um, and actually was the rodeo. What was it? What is it called? The Calgary something. And we actually kind of avoided Calgary that week because I really wanted to see it, but my husband had no desire to get in there with the crowd. So we went to um, Banff instead. Um, but beautiful, beautiful area. Um, all right. So if there's no questions about that, I have a little demo on the on the um, sewing machine I want to show you. I'm going to get this out of the way. And I'm going to scooch over here. I probably have to put my glasses on. All right. So, Gabriella, we're going to switch cameras. Oh, you know what? Let, let me talk for a moment. Let me talk for a moment. Um, a lot of you have heard me do this, and it bears repeating again. Some of you have never. This is probably my most popular tip that people have said that it's a game changer besides my, I'm saying that a lot today. Mr. Bottle is also a game changer. Let's say you wanted to sew two long strips together. These are actually with the fabric, salvage to salvage, but even 12 inch, 15 inch, any two pieces, you're putting a border on. This is, this is good. Um, if you were to just put your needle down and start sewing, oftentimes you get to the end and even though you know they were the same length, you get to the end and they're two different lengths. You're like, what the heck? And then you lift up your piece and you've got a, a bit of a curve going here. 
the reason that happens is because the feed dogs are doing a really good job moving that bottom piece along, but that pot, top piece may not be moving at exactly the same speed. And so you're easing that in and then you're getting a curve. And the answer to this is not, okay, just so the next one from the bottom to the top, that's not the answer. Um, this is also a technique that I do not use pins. Pins are not really going to help me in this case. So I'm going to show you how to hold the fabric as you're sewing to make sure that they feed at the same rate. So if you've heard me say this before, but maybe you forgot it or it didn't apply at the time and you're about to start working on a quilt that has lots of long strips, give it a try. It will, it will be a game changer. Okay, now we're going to switch over to the machine. Pardon my back. All right. So... I'm going to use the needle down as my, my, um, uh, as my third hand here, my, my uh, little, little leader ender there is getting caught. Okay. All right, here we go. So I'm gonna just third hand. All right, so I'm gonna take my needle down, needle down. All right, I'm gonna take my two pieces of fabric and now's the time where I kind of lay one on top of the other. If for a 42 inch piece, I may do this three times, but I'm gonna grasp the fabric with my right or left, it doesn't matter, and I'm gonna kind of turn it into a Z. And I'm gonna pull that fabric taut, not so taut that the machine can't do its job, but not so loose that it can just do whatever it wants. You're in charge. So I'm gonna hold this taut, crank up my speed. When it gets too close, maybe I'll use my fingertips. But in this case, I'm just going to stop, needle down again, rearrange. I may have to do this three or four times for a long piece. I'm using the edge of the foot as my quarter inch seam because I moved my needle over. Some of you are familiar with the fact that most machines these days, you can move a needle over using your stitch width buttons. Again, grasp and turn. And one more. Again, no pins, I'm just holding it. Cut my thread. And we're gonna do the big, the other camera again. So I hold it up, it's straight, there's no, there's no C that the ends are the same length, that is how you sew two pieces together. So again, anything bigger than 12 inch, the last log on a, on a log cabin, um, borders, sashing, um, two strips that you're gonna sub cut later and, and you know, into other pieces. Anytime you're cutting, sewing along, two long strips together, you should be using that technique to make sure they feed at the same rate. And I will say that some machines don't do that. I mean, they behave themselves. But most, and, and it doesn't matter how much you spent on your machine, some machines do it and some, some don't. Um, also, it could have to do with the amount of pressure that your foot is pushing down on your fabric. So if you have a way to adjust the amount of pressure on your, for your pressure foot, presser foot, that is something to look at too. But it's just one of those things that some machines do and some machines don't. So if you're having a problem with with uh, curvy seams, then that will solve your problem for you. So I hope that is helpful. Give it a try, please. We have any comments? Not yet. Okay. Oh, Ohio. Um, hi, Beverly. Yes, it is the best tip how to hold the fabrics. Yep. That is a good one. Okay. If there are no, <clears throat> excuse me, no other questions about that, we're going to move on to a tote bag. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, so this is a denim tote bag I made, I made quite a while ago, but I wanted to show it to you because denim is always in fashion. And I used, of course, denim from various jeans to make this. I used some embroidery. I put my name on it and then flip it over. And I used a pocket, uh, cut a pocket out, put some more embroidery with my name in different fonts. Nobody can, be, nobody can steal this, I'll put my initials up here in the corner. Um, 
So basically just a log cabin method, just kept adding and adding to the center until they came out to about the same size. So a couple of things that I wanted to bring to your attention. Number one, if you are gonna use denim from a thrift, well, denim from anything really, be sure that it is 100% cotton because you want it to what we call rag or bloom. Can we do a closer, no, probably not. Um, can you see how this black fabric did not really bloom at all? I cut it and it just kind of lays there. It's because it has spandex in it. And spandex, even 3% spandex will, will not allow your denim to bloom. So that's just a little, a little tip there um, for making sure everything blooms. You know, if you're, if you're sewing denim and you're not gonna rag the edges, you're just, the seams are gonna go on the inside. It doesn't matter what it's made out of really. Um, I want to talk about the lining for a minute. So I think I have some things in here, so I have to pull them out. But the pockets, kind of a fun idea for the pocket. And um, there's a pocket here, and then a, that's a patch pocket, and this is another patch pocket. So you can, for anything, you could put a patch pocket on top of your pocket. Another thing I did is I lined it with a different color. So I rolled that fabric around to the top before I um, created the pocket and that way I can see from the from the inside of the bag where my pocket starts because I use the same fabric. Of course you wouldn't have to do that if you used a different fabric for the outside of your pocket but for whatever reason I didn't do it that way. So there was that. I also wanted to talk about how um, I use prairie points it's all kind of jumbly here, uh, wrinkly. I use prairie points, which I love on the edge of my bag. But if you're a bag maker, then you're like, okay, then how did she put the handles on? Because usually handles come out of the top of your seam. But in this case, I used, I just sewed my handles just to the front and I put a little raggedy piece of denim on top to cover up the edge of the, um, handle. This bag, has, I have used this bag a lot, so it has seen better days, but uh, just some ideas for you for your next tote bag. Um, I try to teach, you can back it up here, I try to teach a class every fourth quarter called MJ's Easy Tote, and it's basically how to make a tote bag without a pattern. You do not need to go out and buy a pattern every time you want to just make a simple tote bag. So let's say you had some beautiful, you know, big flowers you wanted to make a tote bag with, or you've got some panels you wanted to make a tote bag with. You can make your tote bag any size. So when you come to your class, I give you give you some numbers, but basically that's just a an idea, you know, to start with. But if you have something bigger or smaller, you have some home deck you want to use, you have some denim. Really, you can make your tote bag out of anything. I teach you how to line it. I teach you how to put pockets in it. I teach you how to put handles on it. We don't talk about closures, but um, you can certainly put a closure on the next one you make because mag magnets are easy, Velcro is easy, button is easy. I'm just trying to, this is all in three hours. So we, we make, we finish a bag in three hours. So a closure just takes a little bit longer. Anyway, so that you can look for that. That's called MJ's Easy Tote. And I try to do that every fourth quarter. Um, all right. Any, there's no questions about good morning from Vero beach, um, about, uh, the denim tote bag. We are going to continue. Let me see what was next on my list. Ah, I'm going to take this quilt down. All right. And we're going to talk about this quilt, which I need to open up a little bit because wait till you see the edges. Well, this is a little bit bigger than my space here. What is going on here? Um, so you begin to see the edges. These are scalloped edges. And I'll be honest, I was gonna talk a little bit about how to do scalloped edges, but the ruler that I like to use, they no longer make. What is it these days? Everything is, yeah. So I will, we will talk about scallop edges in the fall probably. I'll make a brand new quilt that has scallop edges because I really think it adds a lot to the quilt. Um, I'm going to show you the corner of this. Look how cute that is. Ah, I just love that corner so much. So, and then of course we've got some um, Rick Rack. You know, I love Rick Rack. That kind of goes with the vintagey look of these um, squares. By the way, let's talk about these squares. This is actually another quilt that could be um, made using uh, panels or squares or those those Dr. Seuss panels if you wanted to make it. This is a pattern called Warm Wishes, and 
You notice I've got a blue frame around this one and a green frame around this one. It's a very old timey pattern called well warm wishes, but it's it's uh, been used for a long time. And um, if you have, thank you, when I'll plug it. If you have taken my beginner quilting class, uh, beginner what quilting basics class, then you know this block. This is this is the rail fence block. It's just a matter of how you lay out those pieces, right? These are all the same, blue, yellow, green, blue, yellow, green, blue, yellow, green. It's just a matter of how you put that block to get these frames. So this fabric, don't ask, don't ask me if we have it in stock. It's really old. Um, this was just some panel that I found in my stash. Somebody probably gave it to me and they are actually um, different states. Um, I actually have two Californias in different colors, probably more than that. There's another California, um, Alaska, Connecticut, and it's kind of a travel, could be a travel quilt. But I really wanted to highlight the fact that, uh, again, you could do t-shirts here, you can do embroidered blocks. So if you're looking to incorporate embro embroidery in your quilts, this would be a great way to go. Warm wishes. Another thing about this pattern is that these three pieces don't have to be the same size. The yellow could be larger and the blue and green could be smaller, or they could, these two could be bigger and this could be just a little stripe. So it is a really easy way to, um, yeah, you could make changes depending on how much you fa fabric you had of each one. Um, I think I bought like two yards of each color and then I used the leftovers on the back. So um, yeah, and there's leftovers, all kinds of leftovers on the back. Um, so I have a quick little demo on that. And I have a question. Alicia asks, those squares are rep replicates of old handkerchiefs. Yes, they are. I have some of those hankies. That's exactly what they are. They're not hankies, but yes, they are They are repli replication. I can't say it. Replicas, thank you. Um, yeah, you can even see some of the little edges here that I couldn't quite cut off on some of these pieces. But yeah, very fun, very fun. So a quick little demo here. Let's do an overhead shot. Um, so, oh, we have so many little, little fun little panels here at the store. So this is one that I, that we had a long time ago, uh, for coffee. And then we had several different coffee, fab coffee bean fabrics. So whatever size this is, is whatever size this needs. And don't ask me why this is not the same size. <laughs> I guess I need to cut a little bit off of this. And if I did, then these two would be smaller and this one would be bigger. But as you can see, there's a lot of different ways you could go with this. You know, and if you wanted this to be a little bit bigger, you could certainly add what we call a coping strip, C-O-P-I-N-G, coping strip. And that would make that big enough. In fact, I've done that a few times in some of my quilts. Um, I needed it to be a certain size. So you just add a little extra. It's better. It's easier if you just like add an inch all the way around and then cut it down to the size you need. That's what I usually end up doing. So that's that's all this is. So whoops, we'd you know be like this. So if I wanted that coffee bean to, to surround this so my blocks would all stay the same, it would just depend on how I laid this out. So that's all I wanted to say about that. So warm wishes, it's a great application for, again, panels, t-shirts, any, it doesn't have to be this size, it could be any size. So let me know if you have questions about that. Buffalo, New York. My parents were born and raised in Buffalo and near the corner of Fay and Walden, if you know where that is. I used to spend summers up there on Fay Street. So good times, good times. Thank you for joining us. Um, all right, what do I have next? Warm wishes, oh, my travel pouch, yes. All right, so, oh, darn it, I forgot to mention the handout that warm wishes is actually the first thing in the handout. So if you're just joining us and you haven't um, printed out the handout, we're gonna put the link again for that, but hopefully you've printed this out by now. Um, so the hand warm wishes i give you all the all the numbers and all the pattern about that so and that there's a second second quilt down here i swear i've lost this i don't remember selling it i don't remember giving it away so i don't know what happened to that quilt i have to make another one uh, but that was a christmas quilt many years ago so now we're going to turn the page to my uh jewelry bag some of you may remember this from back in the day. I, I still use mine. Every time I travel, um, I put jewelry in my little jewelry bag. So I thought I'd bring it back to show you how useful it is. Um, so it's a drawstring, all right? 
and then we open it up and it has eight pockets in it. So it's like kind of like a wagon wheel, spokes of a wagon wheel. So there's all my little pockets. I'll put all my little earrings and maybe a necklace that matches. And then the center, uh, if you have larger items that don't fit in a little pocket, it goes in the center of that and this gets closed up. And it, it's pretty smushable, as you can see. So it goes into a corner somewhere of my um, of my luggage. And that's what I use for my jewelry. Um, <laughs> Quick story, long time ago when I first started making them, I did not know about rat tail, um, which is a kind of a round trim. We sell a bunch of different colors of it and I had no idea. So I literally, there it is. So it's it's round, I'm turning it in my fingers um, and it comes in all different colors. And so I had been making these out of a satiny fabric. So I can't believe I did this. I would cut strips of the satiny fabric and I would fold them in twice and, and sew down the center. And that's what I was using for string. For, I, probably my sisters probably still have those original ones. I, I threw mine out, but they probably still have them. But yes, rat tail is definitely the way to go when you're making drawstrings. I buy a lot of rat tail. I wait till it's on sale or I see a, a good bargain or somebody's giving it away and I, I get everything I can because I use it for so many different things. So here's one in, oh, it's the same one actually. Okay, so that's where we're going. That's where we're headed. And again, if you don't have the handout, print it out. This is the second page of your handout. It's called Drawstring Jewelry Bag. You could also use it. I've seen people put little um, pin cushions in the center and use this for their sewing kits. So you can put spools of thread and, and uh, thimbles and whatever else you need in there. And then the pin cushion in the center. So that's kind of fun. Um, you are going to need, according to my directions, you are gonna need a two fat quarters, for one for the outside fabric, one for the inside fabric. You're also going to need a scrap of batting or Timtex or stiff canvas. I wanted to talk about Timtex for just a moment. Actually, I'm not sure if we sell actual Timtex. That, originally, this was the only thing out there and now there's a bunch of different brands. But we have something called, and I don't know if we put it on the top, I think we put it on the top of our my, um, my favorites page, but we have three versions. We have the simple, uh, simple version with no fusible, and then we have a version that has fusible on one side, and then the third version with fusible on both sides. So that's available for you. Um, and so this is what the reason I'm using this is. I like to put it in the center sometimes of my of my piece. You could also use a couple pieces of batting in the center, but you want something in the center to kind of give it some give that bottom some structure. So that's what that is. Um, these are my very old and well-used um, circles that I have drawn out of fabric, or, sorry, paper, folded up and put in here. So I need, two, I need two circles and you have lots of different ways. You can cut a circle, you can trace a plate and then you could trace a smaller plate, um, you know, any, anywhere, anyhow you wanna get to a circle. So I will need two large circles with my outside fabric and two small circles with my inside fabric. I also need some rat tail um, and uh, yeah, and that batting in the center. So you need four different things. So I'm gonna cut my circles, cut my, cut my drawstrings, and here we go. It's pretty easy. In fact, somebody was just saying that she was making six of them for her, all her besties. If Barbara's listening, she was, she was going to the um, beach and she wanted to make gifts for all her friends. And so they were all gonna get one of these. So that's a fun gift. So where am I, where am I starting here? Let's take these two smaller pieces and we're going to sew all the way around, no stopping. Then we're going to put a little hole on one side of it. And that if you've ever turned something around and I, I can do this because that hole will be hidden inside my piece. So this is going to get flipped right side out and pressed. And yes, you probably want to sew all the way around it to kind of keep it, keep it where it needs to be. All right. Then I'm going to take my two, I keep picking up the wrong one. Um, this is the outside piece and we need to put in two buttonholes. And I know some people don't like buttonholes. Some people have never made buttonholes. So let's just talk about buttonholes for a minute. Why do I need buttonholes? That's what the drawstrings come out of. Yes, you could also use grommets, but buttonholes, I would really love for you to try making them if you've never made them with your sewing machine because they are really a nice thing to know how to do, even if you never make clothes. Sometimes it's nice to have a buttonhole. Um, 
The one thing I know on my Janome 6700, most Janomes and probably other machines too, there's a little tab that comes down. Let's see if this one has it. Yep. We're going to bring this machine around here for a second so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. Can you see it? So there's this little, this little gray tab here. This, yep, there you go. Like this, yep. So this come, this tab comes down and most machines have something like that. And what that's doing is it's talking to your buttonhole um, foot. So the foot runs along and when it hits the tab, it says, oh, it's time to stop and turn around and do the next step. So that's gotta come down. If you've never done that before, that, I had no idea what that was back there. That's your buttonhole tab. And of course, you're gonna make several buttonholes and you're gonna try it out on some scrap fabric before you ever. So, and I, even now, I, I know how to make buttonholes, but I always make one buttonhole on whatever fabric and interfacing and fusible, whatever, before I actually do it on my project because I don't make buttonholes that often. So I always have to practice a little bit. So again, um, that's what I did here. And you'll notice I put my famous fusible trico on the inside. So you're giving your fabric a little bit of stabilization before you sew that buttonhole. Um, and for those that were watching me on Monday, I forgot to say that part, but that's probably an important part. I'm sure I put it on my handout. But And what we're doing there, how do we figure out where to put those buttonholes? I am, hang on, I'll find it. Um, I'm taking my little circle and I'm laying it down. So the buttonholes need to go just on the outside, like where my fingers are of the, um, of the smaller piece. Because, 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 so my drawstring is going to be just outside of this smaller, smaller blue piece. Hope that, hopefully that makes sense. So once I do those buttonholes, then it's time to, I'm drawing a blank here for a second here. Give me a second. Okay. So now it's time to take this piece and let's say I've got another piece with buttonholes on it. This is the outside. Um, and I'm going to sew, did I sew all the way through here? All this, I'm sorry. I'm completely losing it. No, it looks like I didn't. Oh, this is that satiny fabric that I made. So I'm going to sew my wheels on the single, on the single outside piece. I'm going to sew all the way around my little circle of batting. I kind of, kind of feel it, just kind of know where it is with maybe a walking foot, go around, but it doesn't have to be. You could just use a regular foot, go around it. And then you're going to sew your wagon wheels. So, you know, 12 o'clock, six o'clock, three o'clock, nine o'clock, and then um, halfway in between those. Let's see if I can find one that you can see. Well, you can see it in the picture, my wagon wheels. I keep calling a wagon wheel. Once I've done that with a single layer of outside fabric, it's finally time to sew it to the buttonhole one. This one already has buttonholes. I'm gonna sew all the way around, except I'm gonna leave a, leave a space to turn. Um, and you've probably heard this tip, maybe you haven't, but when I'm doing something like that, I invariably, I forget and I just keep on sewing and I accidentally close that hole. So what I like to do is put two uh, pins where I want to stop. So I'm sewing round and around and around and around and around. Oh, I'm in another world. And then all of a sudden I see, what are my two pins? Oh yeah, I got to stop. So that's my, that's my signal to myself to stop sewing. So now I can flip this right side out and all the only thing left to do then is to go all the way around and create that drawstring. And the buttonhole is already in place. So I'm going to sew around this twice and probably can't even see the, see the stitching. Let's see, let's see if we can see the stitching with another camera. Mm -hmm. I should, oh, look at that. Wow, good job. So you can see my drawstring. I stitched on either side of that. Where's my buttonhole? Oh, there it is. So that you can't, there's a buttonhole there. So I'm drawing, I'm sewing on the top and the bottom of that buttonhole and that's room to go around. And I darn got it. I forgot my bodkin again, um, but I have a little a little tool that I use to push through. You could also use a safety pin, but the bodkin's nice because you don't have to tie your drawstring on like you do with a safety pin. But anyway, you're going to run it through. You're going to one piece through all the way around and back up, and then you're going to turn this around, and you're going to sew. You're going to 
uh, safety pin or bodkin all the way around and come back up. That way, when I go to pull these closed, it's a beautiful thing. So hopefully that made sense. I think the handouts should also help a lot. So Krista, I can, oh, she just, Krista started right something and then she changed her mind. Um, okay. If there's no questions about that, I will continue on. Hope I, hopefully I didn't go too fast. I got excited about it. Um, I'm going to move that over. All right. Oh, and these pieces and that piece. All right. What is next on my list here? Oh, the, um, Scala placemat. Some of you may remember this. I taught this a few times and I was thinking lately, it's time to bring it back because I think these are very cool placemats. Scalloped placemats, I made this out of um, Valentine fabric and I made kind of a uh, reverse image one, dark and light and light and dark. But this is, this is where we're headed. And if you're thinking that, oh my goodness, I can't imagine cutting out all those scallops perfectly. The good news is you don't have to. Um, I've got a very simple, simple um, system here. And I know some of you have made it and loved it and came back and got, and got more foam because it was awesome. Here's the secret right here. This is a scallop placemat. Um, we have these forms for sale. They're on my favorites page. Um, and there's four in a package. So you can make four matching placemats at a time. It, the pattern tells you how much fabric to buy, but I'm going to show you how this works. Um, there's also patterns for the exact same product, but there's also a pattern to make a scallop box and a scallop purse. So maybe if you don't use placemats, but you love scallops, that might be a way to go. So here, here's, here's what we're going to do. Let's, let's back it up. Yep. So we are going to make something that looks like this. And by the way, what the pattern tells you, you can make you can use up to four different colors, which I did on this. So the back had one Christmas fabric. The front has one, two, three other fabrics. That's four different fabrics. For this model, I only use two fabrics. I use a dark hearts and a light background hearts. So you can go, you can go as, two, as little as two or three or four fabrics for these placemats. Um, again, it's way easier than you think. I can't wait to show you. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, and the, the numbers, you've got to cut exactly the right numbers here. I'm going to clean this off. And these are the mitered front pieces. Let me just show you again on a finished, finished one. So first I'm going to build this, what I call a frame, okay? So we're going to build the frame with these four pieces of fabric. This one's the odd man out. So it tells you how long to cut these pieces. And then you need a piece of green. This green, it looks like it started out an inch and a quarter, probably folded in half right sides to, sorry, right sides out and then sewed it down to the front of this. And when you fold it back, you get that beautiful, um, uh, what looks like a border, but it's really like a faux, a faux border because it's like flat piping, right? So we do that four times. Now we're gonna lay this out, make it look like a frame. All right, so there's my frame. And these corners are mitered. Yeah, I'm gonna bring this up a little bit. These corners are mitered. The way you do this is you sew, whoops, wrong way. You sew like this, you end up with a mitered corner. So you're gonna sew from this point, you're gonna draw a 45 degree line with your ruler. And if you've never done that, there's different different um, rule, different lines here. This is a 45. So, but I want to do it this way. So I'm going to take my 45 and line it up along here. And now I can draw that draw that line with chalk, right? So again, if I were to sew that line and bring it around, that makes a beautiful mitered corner. Um, and then the same thing on this corner, the same thing on, on the other other two corners. So now I've got my frame. What the heck am I going to do with this frame? If there's questions, please yell them out. Um, now I'm going to take my foam. And by the way, it's fusible on both sides. So they tell you to cut a piece. And by the way, I cut my piece smaller than the pattern says, because the pattern actually has this fabric coming all the way out to the edge, but I don't need that much. 
so I cut it a little smaller. I don't know the numbers, but you can figure it out when you start. Make your first one and then figure out how much smaller you can make the rest. So I press this down. Again, this is fusible, so I could just hit it with my iron and fuse this down. Now I'm going to fuse uh, more fabric to the back so that I fuse the green to the back. All right. And as you can see, this is a pretty cool thing here. I took that frame that I just made. I laid it down on the back, right sides together. Kind of, it takes a little bit. I looks like I opened up my seams here to make my liners nice and flat. And once everything looks good, probably threw a bunch of pins in to make sure everything lays flat. Now I can baste along these edges with just big old hunk and stitch. All right. One of the last steps is to flip this over. And I'm going to take, I probably used my zipper foot so I could get my needle in nice and tight. And Gabrielle, let's see if we can get oh, those beautiful close-up shots you did before. Um, let's see. Can you even see that? I don't know you can see my stitching. Did I stitch? Oh, I didn't stitch. Whew. That's why I can't see it. Here's one, here's one that I stitched. Um, you could see you could see my stitching to go around, but that's where I've already trimmed it. But this one I haven't sewn it yet. But I'm gonna go in really nice and tight. We're gonna go back to the overhead. So sorry about that. But anyway, we're gonna use our zipper foot and we're gonna go in nice and tight right next to the foam all the way around. That's what creates your beautiful scallop edges is sewing with that zipper foot. Once I do that, I can trim it down and I also you could see I've got a, I've cut it um, as tight as I can, just up to the stitching, but not through the stitching, of course. But every and every single scallop I've sewn, all, almost, I'm sorry, I've cut almost to the stitching. And that really helps be able to flip this over. So now finally, it's time. I have the backing is fused. Whoops. I have the backing is fused. I have my frame sewn on. And now it's finally time to flip this over. Yep. And as you can see, those scallops, whoops, there's a hole in that one because I've done this so many times. We'll go this direction. As you can see, this is if you just keep uh, flipping over the scallops and pushing it in with your thumb, you get these beautiful scallops, scalloped edges. Um, and this is not very beautiful because I still need to do some work on it. But you get the idea. You're going to flip it all the way out. And then the final step, of course, stay right there, is to um, is to top stitch the edges, you know, very close to the edge, probably pressing it and then stitching it. I also stitched along here. Um, this is still free and flappy, and of course you could stitch that down as well. But I definitely want to stitch this down. I want to make these placemats as washable as possible, and that would be the way to do it: is to stitch right there on that on that red. You could use your decorative stitching there if you so desired, lots of possibilities, but this is infinitely washable once you've done your top stitching around the edges and the edges. So hopefully that made sense. I'm gonna take this apart. So I'll be ready for the next time I do a demo. Um, and if there's any questions, I'd love to see them. Um, we've put up the um, handouts link and I've mentioned the Memorial Day um, sale, but I'll say it again. If you um, type in when you're checking out online, if you type in Memorial Day 30, all uppercase, that is our that's your coupon code to get everything 30% off everything that is regularly priced. I'm gonna get that word eventually. Um, got a couple more things to show you. Actually, one more thing to show you. Let me pull this quilt down. It's a big quilt, biggest one I got here today. Got lots of oohs, oohs and ahs on this, this last quilt. Um, I think everybody loved the colors. And let me just talk about the colors for a few minutes. This is an uber scrappy quilt. Oftentimes when we hear the word scrappy, we think every color in the rainbow, but it doesn't have to be. I, I sort my scraps by color. And then maybe I just, uh, oftentimes I'll make a quilt with just a subset of all the scraps I have. So this of course has yellows, oranges, reds, and pinks. And I think it makes it a super happy quilt. While Gabrielle is giving you a close up 
um, I quilt, where are we here? Where are you? Um, I quilted this um, with a uh, Suns. And if you're wanting to do fun little quilty free motion designs, um, highly recommend going to Pinterest and typing in FMQ, free motion quilt, sun or butterfly or daisy or whatever you want. And somebody has figured out how to do it. Go around twice, do these little things and then come out, whatever it is. Lori Kennedy is somebody who does a lot of that. A lot of tutorials on uh, free motioning, all kinds of nifty um, designs. So it's probably one of hers. But anyway, I called it Good Morning Sunshine because it is a pretty happy quilt. So on the scrappy areas, I quilted it with straight lines and then uh, curved around and went back up, up and down and up and down. So there's a lot going on. But I think what makes this quilt successful is the combination of colors. And again, I've just done a subset and I think that really helps make a quilt more successful. So let's talk about how I made this quilt. Um, if you've been with me for a little while, you may have seen my um, nifty four patch method. Let's do an overhead. Um, this is sort of like that, but sort of not. Let's say I've got two squares and they don't have to be dark and light. They could be um, dark and dark or light and light. It doesn't matter. If I put these together, right sides together, and a lot of times when I'm doing this, I'll actually press them because maybe I'm making a big stack and maybe these are my leaders and enders. So if I press them together, they will kiss together really well and I can pile them up and later I pick them up as a unit and take it to my machine and sew and things don't get out of whack. Anyway, I'm gonna sew on the left side and the right side of this square. When I cut it in half this way and cut it in half this way, guess what I get? I'm sure you can imagine here. I'm going to build it so you can see. So here it is. I've sewn on both sides of that five inch square. If I cut it down the middle and cut it across, I end up with four twosies. And I can't even open it, apparently. Okay, so there's a twosie. So I end up with four of those. Um, the quilt behind me is made with five pieces at once. And so I could take that twosie and another twosie. And there's a completely different one here. Well, almost different. And then another, another piece. Well, there we go. Um, so five, five all together. This is a great uh, leader ender project. So every time you finish up a chain of um, pieces, you could pick up two of something and sew them together. And before you'll know it, you'll have a whole nother quilt. The other part of this quilt, of course, are these vertical um, pieces. So Gabrielle, let's go back up to the quilt itself. Um, so this is one, two, three, four, five. So all of these are five little squares, right? And then these, there's no reason to piece these because it's all the same fabric. Of course you could. You could make five darks and then five lights and put them together, but I didn't want to work that hard. So these are just solid pieces of looks like a white grunge with a little bit of green in it and actually this is a little this piece is a little bigger than the one i use it looks like but you get the idea so i've got a piece like this and a piece like this somebody asked me on monday where was the block and let's do a let's do a full size here there is no block on this one it i actually sewed it in columns so i put this quilt on my design wall in columns and then I went back and sewed this to this, to this, to this, to this, to this. And the nice thing about putting it up on the design wall is you get to see, oh, I've got three yellows across the way. I've got to, I've got to move things around. Oh, I've got three reds over here. I've got to move things around. So it's a good way to check your, check your placement, make sure there's good distribution of colors before you sew everything together. But yes, it's sewn in columns. So what I'll do is I'll put it all up see what I like. And then I'll, I'll pin, the, pin these two together, pin these together. So I have a whole column of fabric and pins, and then I'll take that to my machine and I will sew all the pieces end to end to end, and then put it back up here and then pick up the next one and do the same thing. So it's very much a design wall quilt. It's not one of these quilts. You just pick up two blocks and sew them together and it's always going to work. It's not that kind of quilt. Um, it's a design design. By the way, if you don't have a design wall, 
Um, there's several options. One is to get a big piece of flannel and pin it up on a wall or a board. If you don't have a wall that can stay as a design wall, no worries. You can take, you can, you know, put some clips up on top and clip. Um, I often recommend a flannel backed vinyl tablecloth. They're fairly, fairly inexpensive. The flannel on the back will allow you to stick fabric to it. So when I, people come to my class and we need, uh, everybody needs a design wall, I have them bring flannel backed vinyl tablecloths, Amazon, Walmart, Dollar Tree, whatever. Um, and then we can clip them to the, uh, to the wall and then they have a, a, a wall, way to do it. You can also use a bed. You can also use the floor. You know, any, anything you can use to lay things out is wonderful. Lockport, Illinois. Hi, Shirley. Are you on vacation or did you just find us? Um, Judy asked if it says 30% off one regularly priced item. No, it's 30% off your entire transaction. So if you, whatever you put in your shopping cart, it's going to be 30% off the regularly priced items. If there's something on sale, whatever the higher sale is, that's what you're going to get. If you discover that, oh my goodness, I forgot to buy five yards of something. It's a big purchase. I want to get another 30% off. You can come in the store and get the 30% off again, but it's off one transaction for the weekend. And by the way, the sale goes until Monday at midnight. So enjoy, keep your, keep your um, cart, uh, keep filling that cart. I can't guarantee there's one or two items that that the item, I don't know how that works with a shopping cart. If somebody puts it in their shopping cart, does it stay in there until they purchase or if, can somebody pull it out from under them? I don't even know. I don't know how that works. Um, I don't know how it works shopping anywhere, really. Um, any questions? Because I think I've told you everything I want to tell you for today. So I enjoyed this. Um, uh, if you have questions later, you can put them in the comments or you can send me an email. On the bottom of every handout is my email address as well as my website. So if you're interested in that roomy board, you can go to my website and um, my husband will make one for you. All right. I think that's everything I wanted to talk about. So I really appreciate you joining me today. And I hope you have a good rest of your Memorial Day weekend. I hope you're going to do something fun. I think I'm just going to sew because that's really what I want to do. So take care, guys. Thanks for joining me.